The San Diego Union Tribune is San Diego's largest and most experienced news organization. Winner of four Pulitzer Prizes and 37 regional Emmys. We deliver the news with depth, authority, and over 150 years of local knowledge. Our journalists speak truth to power. The Union Tribune serves everyone who cares about our community. Support our work. Subscribe to down our website, sandiegouniontribune.com. Los habitantes de San Diego logran grandes cosas todos los días. Nos preocupamos por nuestros vecinos y por nuestra comunidad. Nos adaptamos al cambio. Hacemos que nuestros líderes rindan cuentas. Vivimos en una de las ciudades más dinámicas de América, el San Diego Union Tribune y el Union Tribune en español. Hemos contado la historia de San Diego por más de 150 años. We use our phones to order food, share our stories, and so much more. SDCCU made banking from your mobile device easy too. You can do so much. Get up-to-date account balances, deposit checks, and more safely and securely, all through the convenience of your smartphone. Get all of this and more with free checking with e-statements. SDCCU, it's not big bank banking, it's better. Hello, I'm Dr. Noelle Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of San Diego. And I'm Brian Clack, a Vassiliadis Director of USD's Humanities Center. USD, along with the College of Arts and Sciences and the Humanities Center, is proud to be the presenting sponsor for the 2022 San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books on the USD campus. Our partnership with the Festival of Books enables all of us avid readers to come together as a community alongside renowned authors from all over the world and to dive deeply into imaginative stories and important themes. As a university deeply committed to the liberal arts, USD promotes a form of lifelong learning that ignites curiosity, builds critical connections across different ideas and topics by seeing them from different perspectives. On behalf of the University of San Diego, we thank you for joining us for today's program to explore the world of books with us. Enjoy the festival. Welcome everyone to the San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books. My name is Dana Littlefield. I am public safety editor at the Union Tribune. Um, I'd like to introduce our authors uh, who will be speaking to us today. I've, we've got a very exciting discussion for you. They are Mark Lamont Hill. He is an award-winning journalist and author. He is one of the leading intellectual voices in the country. And he is currently the host of BET News and a political contributor for CNN. He is the Steve Charles Chair in Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also are joined by Todd Brewster. He is a veteran journalist and historian who has worked as an editor for Time and Life and is a senior producer for ABC News. He is co-author with Peter Jennings of the number one New York Times bestselling book, The Century, and the author of the acclaimed Lincoln's Gamble. Thank you so much, Todd, for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, so we are here today to discuss your latest endeavor. Uh, the book is right here, Seen, whoops, there we go now, Seen and Unseen, uh, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice. Um, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. Um, at the risk of grossly oversimplifying, uh, my understanding of the book is that basically it's about how technology's role and technology that's technology in a variety of forms, has helped to shape the civil rights movement. Uh, more recently, uh, the social justice movement, racial justice movement. Uh, 
And you give us quite a deep historical context for that. Am I am I on base, off base? How you're on, you're on. You, you okay. have it. Yes. All right, great. So my question is, just to start off with, uh, to the two of you gentlemen, why write this book now? It's my understanding that you know some people will be, or at least I was, familiar with some of the themes in this book. For example, the cell phone has been a game changer in a lot of different ways. But why take on this topic? Now, I'm, I know it's much more multi-layered than I just described. I, I think it's the right question. Um, and the why of it is a place where we begin in the book itself. We're trying to make sense of the really the, the brutal murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And as citizens, we were outraged as um, people who care about justice. We were unsettled. But as writers and journalists and scholars, we wanted to help tell a story that not only made readers understand this better, but it was a form of inquiry for ourselves. You know, we, we wanted to understand this more deeply. I think we were like everybody else who was in America and really around the world watching for over nine minutes the killing of George Floyd. We were home. Uh, many of us were working from home because of the pandemic. We had been fed a steady diet of media images and, and death sequences uh, and stories of death sequences. You know, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. We'd seen the, the ridiculousness in Central Park with Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper when he was bird watching. And then the next thing you know, this awful, brutal killing happens and an international movement emerged from it. Laws were changed. Eyes were opened. Innocence was lost, uh, as they say. And we wanted to know why this moment? What is it about this moment, this technology, this media that made it the moment in a way that Trayvon Martin wasn't though we thought it might be, that Mike Brown wasn't quite though we thought it was at the time, right? What made this the thing? And in telling that story, and, I, and, and so much of this goes to Todd's genius as a historian, so much of that story that we're telling about the contemporary contemporary moment linked us to so many previous moments that we wanted to unpack and unsettle and link. And and I know I learned a great deal with this project um, and, uh, and we hope readers do too. I'd add to that, that, you know, I mean, Mark is absolutely on point that for us, it was as much a discovery project as it was something uh, to uh, share with everyone. I mean, it was, I think we both wondered why George Floyd and and what was it about that particular video that made it so compelling that it drove people to the streets? And of course, as Mark mentioned, that there are other factors involved. There's the the pandemic itself, people working from home, the sense of frustration, the um, lack of progress, uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, and the steady drumbeat of of other episodes that have led up to this. But there was something about that particular video and. And, and I think it had to do both with the history of the way that the story of race relations in America has been told through the, through the media, and also the nature of that particular uh, recording of that event in that it was both a moving image and in a sense a still image because it never leaves that particular scene. It's almost sculptural. You have a man, white man with his knee in the neck of a black man, his head lying on the pavement with uh, right next to the tire of a police cruiser and holding that pose nonchalantly on the part of the, the police officer for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And I think we as people, as readers, as, as consumers of media react to both the literal message in media and to the symbolic message in media. And the symbolic message there, the knee and the neck, resonated so much with our understanding of what the relationship, the power relationship has been between white and black America. It became almost undeniable. You know, it's interesting. I want to kind of pause on the points you just made, mm -hmm. Todd, um, about what it was specifically about that video, about the George Floyd video, because we've seen video before. Um, I'm sure you all have been asked in the context of your work in this book, you know, uh, uh, 
about, for example, Rodney King. You know, we've seen we've seen video before, um, and this book draws upon images um, related to a variety of events. George Floyd, we know about Ahmaud Arbery. You talk about Charlottesville at great length in this book. You talk about uh, Kenosha. What was it since since we we what we do know about the Internet and, you know, this age that we live in is that we are bombarded with images and that a lot of these images seem to lack a permanence or lack of stickiness for us. What was it about? And and I realized that you already spoke to this to some degree already, but I'm wondering if the both of you will go there a bit further. Um, What was it about? the George Floyd video itself that made it stick for us. I think there were a couple of other, if I could start here, Mark, a couple of other things that I think the video contained. Um, and it, some of it came in the spirit of understanding how the video was made. You know, you go back to Rodney King, uh, which the 30th anniversary of Rodney King is being acknowledged this year. Um, that video compelling as it was, was shot by a professional or a man who had ambitions to become a professional uh, videographer, uh, video journalist. Uh, He had very sophisticated equipment that he had just apparently ordered and received um, and was trying it out from a window at a high rise and when he saw what was happening with Rodney King. But the video that we recognize as telling the story of George Floyd's killing was shot by Darnella Frazier, a teenager, on her way to cup foods with her sister for snacks. I mean, there couldn't be anything more innocent. This was not someone out to, this was not a professional journalist. It was not an activist. It was not someone who had uh, heard tell of, a, of, of the violence being committed on the streets of Minneapolis and went running out to, to witness it. It was a teenage girl walking the streets on her way with her sister to get snacks. So that the the immediacy of that um, tells us and the randomness of that tells us the ubiquitous nature of this kind of violence. Um, It also tells us something about the democratization of journalism or of the recording of our world. I mean, it was not someone, as I said, with professional skills here It was someone had a cell phone, something we all have. We hold in our, our pockets the technology, more sophisticated technology than was used to, to film the, the killing of Rodney King 30 years ago. Every one of us has it. And everyone has that opportunity to be able to surveil those in power, which is what essentially Darnella Frazier was doing, uh, in, in a way that turns the tables back on the surveillance society that we all have wittingly or unwittingly become a part of. So I, I think that the democratization of it, the innocence of it, and then the image itself, as I said before, that it had this symbolic quality. We go into some depth on on other images, other still images that have had great resonance. The Kent State killings in, in the 19, in 1970, the the, um, the 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 killing of uh, Emmett Till, um, which was uh, the open casket that Mamie Till insisted upon so that the world could see what they've done to my baby, as she said. That image was seared in the minds of those who saw it for the first time, uh, black people who saw it the first time in Jet Magazine, you know, which was the social media of the time in a way. And, and, and these are the, or the tank man, as he's referred to, you know, the man who went out in the Tiananmen Square riots in China in the 19, in late 1980s, I think it was 1989, I may have that wrong, um, and confronted a tank, sort of the individual standing up to power, right? And this power dynamic between those you are photographing and crystallizing in this sim- in these simple images that have this that have this resonance, it has been the subject of journalism that has this sort of resonant quality for some time. But here we have it in both video and sculptural form, both still and moving. And so I think it speaks to the nature of our time in that we have multiple devices with multiple forms of media. The real question is the one that you posed at the end there, which is, will this have a durability that those other images had? Those other images came to us in in a world that was less media-drenched than our own image, our own uh, moment is. 
Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that as powerful as George Floyd was, only, we will only know as life plays out how durable that image will be and how, how, um, how uh, uh, influential that image will be in, in, in sparking reform. I think it's also, and I, it, that's spot on everything Todd just said, and, and I think that there's something about this image that forced white America, the image and the both the video and the image, right? The still and the video, the still nature of it, because they're looking at the knee on the neck, as Todd said, for nine minutes and 29 seconds, and then the actual filmic nature of it, which also gives it a sense of this is real, this is happening, right? I mean, it's the same thing Kyle Rittenhouse was able to convince people of, right? It's that it, it's live, I have a video camera here, so however I'm telling the story, it must be true because everybody's watching it, right? We mm -hmm. tend to believe it when it's, when it's filmed in a certain way. But there's something about this particular, particular um, image that caused an uproar because it lacked any, it, it didn't allow for many of the excuses that the United States and white America in particular can often bring to incidents of state violence against black people. You know, there's the question of, well, if you're wearing a hoodie in my neighborhood, what would I do? Right? There's the he shouldn't have run. There's the, well, he had a weapon. Yeah, but did the weapon require lethal force? Oh, this guy in the parking lot in Atlanta and at the Wendy's, he, you know, he, he took the cop's taser. Sure, shouldn't take a cop's taser, but, but he's running away. Do you shoot him in the back? Or I but thought he had a weapon. Oh, I thought he had a weapon. That's the, you know, that's the big one, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, you know, it's either he had a weapon, I thought he had a weapon, he looked like he might have had a weapon, or in the case of Mike Brown, even when you look at uh, Darren Wilson's grand jury testimony, and there's a way in which the, the black body itself is seen as a weapon, a, mm -hmm. a, a weapon of mass destruction that must be taken down. He, you know, I, the threat was stopped. It, I shot it. It was like it was walking through bullets, right? Th these sort of irrational white supremacist myths about black people um, are often brought into the analysis, that's the thing, the video is a text, the photo is a text, and we all bring things to a text, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's based on our own history, our own knowledge, our own experiences, our own biases. And so when black people get killed by the government and by police in particular, and um, police are saying, we're innocent, we also bring our social disposition and our social tendency to give police officers the benefit of the doubt, right? We, we come to the video with an assumption that if police did it, it had to be done. And so all this stuff comes to the table. And so when we hear about Trayvon Martin, we're sympathetic, but we're like, Zimmerman must have had a reason. He's not a cop, but he must have had a reason, even though the police are saying stand down. And, you know, Mike Brown, well, were his hands really up? And they, okay, they weren't. So then maybe, you know, what's going on? He did steal that cigarillo from the store, um, et cetera. But when you get to George Floyd, um, it's hard to come up with an excuse. He wasn't fighting anybody. He was begging for mercy. He was crying for his mother. The knee was in his neck for minute after minute after minute after minute after minute after minute after minute. It's impossible to look at that and not say that man didn't deserve to die that day. In the same way that Emmett Till's head, three times the normal size, in that open casket, there's no way to look at that and say he deserved that. Even Rodney King, when the when the when the when the lawyers were in the courtroom and they tried to convince you that this PCP smoking angry black man is so violent that if we had stopped beating him for a moment, he would have beaten all of us and run through L.A. hitting everybody. Right? There's a way that our, the the courtroom and the and the mythologies around police that we hadn't completely worked through yet 30 years ago, and we still haven't. But but we were much very much in a different place that we could. Be, some of us were convinced that our eyes were lying, but not this time. This was something else. This was the kind of image that, that goes along with, with Tiananmen Square, Tank Man. This goes in, in Todd Wright's 89. You know, th th this goes along with innocent black people on a Pettus Bridge. This is, this is a moment where you can't deny it. And so America was forced to come to terms with something different. It was forced to come to terms with the fact that innocent black people are harmed. And they wouldn't have been harmed had they not been black. And that, and, and that means something. That means something. And that they don't have to be innocent. 
They don't have to be angels. Because George Floyd, as Candace Owens said, wasn't no angel. But he also didn't deserve the death penalty. That's why this was different. And it was evidence of something that a large segment of our society knows acutely that we see, that we see all the time. And now you got to see it. Yes. You, that other person, you got that's, to see it. That's you what know, we see. You know, it's like, I, I'm sorry, I'm a, I grew up as a pro wrestling fan, right? And there's this way that in, pro, in the old WWF in the 80s, you'd be wrestling and you'd be winning and you'd be beating the guy. And then somehow the ref would get knocked out and somebody would come in with a chair and, and <laughs> knock you, and hit, you know what I mean? Hit you and you get pinned three counts. The whole arena saw it. Mm-hmm. You got hit with the chair. Yeah, you know, allegedly your head is hurting. You're knocked out. The whole world saw it except the one person that needs who matters, the referee, the judge, <laughs> the decider. You know, that, that's how black people feel sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, Y'all don't see this. <laughs> and this was like the one time where the ref woke up in time to see the chair hit somebody. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. okay, maybe y'all wasn't lying. Yeah. You know, that because so many times we think they see it. Rodney King, we got disappointed. Uh, Walter Scott, we got disappointed. I'm going down the list of disappointments, but this time it was like, come on, y'all, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, would, I would add to that that that, that um, it was even more remarkable that it had the resonance in a time when we are being told over and over again, don't believe your eyes, right? right. When we're being told that everything is biased, there is no truth, there is no... no, uh, no Whatever you see, somebody manipulated it to 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 uh, to try to try to get at your emotions. But the fact that this resonated at true as true through all that that baggage uh, made it all the more compelling. And I think it was the thing that a lot of white people woke up and said, "Oh, they haven't been lying." Yeah. Oh, it really all those things we saw before maybe they were true. And also. Oh, well, maybe if you're not, uh, uh, maybe even if you have uh, a a struggle with drugs or with crime, you don't deserve to die to make that distinction, right? Right. And Mark pointed out one other thing, and and, and and Dan, I want to make sure your audience hears this because I think it is, we talked about the iconography of the image, but the crying out for his mother. Mm. In a in a moment when we're really watching a crucifixion, right? Christ crying out for his father. I'm not not equating George Floyd here with Jesus Christ, but I'm equating that that symbolism of of someone who is is asking for mercy, and clearly watching it, you know who the evil party is. That resonates with so, so many people. Todd, you talk, you mentioned the word baggage, and mm. that resonates with me after reading this book by the two of you gentlemen, because there's a lot of discussion in the book. Of, there's a lot of context in the book for these instances, these murders, these shootings, these you know, all the different ways we can characterize the specific incidents that you um, elaborate on in the book. Um, you know, there's this kind of question of, of what we view as authentic. Mm-hmm. And what we view as, as authentic is colored by the baggage that we bring to that mm-hmm. image. Mm-hmm. Um, context is important, as we all know. Um, the three of us are journalists. We understand the importance of context. But boy, when it comes to context here, y'all went there. You know, I mean, you went you went deep. You went all the way back to, you know, Ida B. Wells and beyond. Mm. Can we talk a bit about, you know, what that context can teach us? Is it simply a matter, again, at the risk of grossly uh, uh, oversimplifying, Um, You know, what is that context meant to teach us here? Mm. Well, um, the context is that we are a people who have struggled with the uh, issue of race from our founding, from before our founding. 
um, we have watched that issue play out both in real terms um, that uh, and in terms that are are uh, are our displacement, I guess you could say, of the violence that's committed on in in real life into the forms of media that we use to tell our story. The um, if you ask a foreigner what um, was the crowning moment of American race relations, they'll probably point to two of them. One was the American Civil War, and the second one would be the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. And I said that before, but I think that's probably right, wouldn't you say, Mark? Oh, yeah, probably sure, right. Sure, sure. And yet, both stories are both both stories are animated in the American imagination by the rule of media, and both stories. Uh, have been told and retold in ways that distort, confirm, stretch, um, pulverize sometimes what really happened, right? And um, I'm thinking here particularly of the Civil War, which to most Northerners and and um, most people who know the history will say that it was the uh, triumph of the North over the South and a war that was fought to end slavery. But the a different story, uh, what's often referred to as the lost cause, um, has been sort of percolating in the background, uh, not only in the South, um, but in large parts of the North as well. It says the war was really fought by by the North against the South, and the South was the more virtuous party, and they were more attached to the principles of the Constitution than the North was. And that, in fact, the war was not about slavery at all. It was about states' rights. It was about the the um, uh, uh, the the violence committed by the North against the the South by the centralized authority of of the federal government against the the people of the states, and this story, which also includes as a byproduct that slavery was while a an evil a necessary evil because the people that were being subjected to to um, uh, 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 the, the evils of slavery were somehow subhuman. And um, the, the place that gets most, that story gets best told, I would say, was in the most a remarkable film called The Birth of a Nation, which your, your viewers will no doubt be familiar with, but which told the story of the Civil War and in a sense, in a way to try to retell it that uh, in the terms of the lost cause, including the, the, the depiction of black people as lazy, ignorant, foolish, comic, corrupt, um, dirty, disgusting, sex uh, obsessed, crime obsessed. And it wasn't just in that movie, which by the way, was an amazing achievement. It was one of the first real uh, cinematic uh, full length feature produced um, in, uh, uh, as a film uh, by a brilliant director who embraced the lost cause, whose father fought for the Confederacy. But that story lived on in Jim Crow. It lived on in academia, even as a as an alternative explanation for what happened in the Civil War, and didn't actually come uh, to under uh, an assault from the other side again until we get to the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. Another story told through pictures, through the fire hoses of, of Bull Connor on on the the uh, protesters over the the killing of the young girls at the Birmingham um, uh, church, um, where there is a photograph of a police officer with his knee in the neck of a woman lying prone on the pavement, protesting. These stories are part of our DNA. And it has, the story is not just in one progressive direction. It's a step one way and a step back. It's a persistent fighting or refighting of the civil war so I, I think the context is extremely important for people to understand. This does not come out of nowhere when the when the um, when the uh, the protesters, the the white supremacists, the neo Nazis are marching in Charlottesville. They are they are shouting. Um, uh, they do not replace us. Do not replace us. Replacement theory is front and center. Um, uh, the Jews will not replace us. Um, anti-Semitism along with this racism. The, and what are, they, what are they there to protest? The removal of two statues in parks in Charlottesville, one of Robert E. Lee, one of Stonewall Jackson, heroes of the Confederacy. That's a symbolic march, right? 
And in the day before that march happened, when the neo-Nazis arrive in Charlottesville, where do they go? They go to a statue of Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, who's complicated. The story is complicated because he also is the author of the Declaration of Independence and the line, all men are created equal. And who, does he, who do the neo-Nazis meet when they get there? They meet a ring of students from the University of Virginia who have ringed themselves around Jefferson's statue to protect Jefferson from the neo-Nazis who are there to protect Jefferson from the students. The Civil War, America's history with race, is being fought today with that backdrop. Wow. Yeah. And it's interesting to me, based on, you know, reading your book, that the, the context is important. The context is interesting. And we bring that context to what we see now. The whole segment that you wrote on the video related to the Arbery shooting and how that was released by the lawyers for the McMichaels, I think it was, um, them thinking that that video would somehow support their narrative. And I think the point that you make, please, again, forgive me if I'm mischaracterizing this in any way, is, you know, they brought to that their viewing of that video all of the baggage, yep. all of the the history all of the mischaracterization of this racial struggle over, you know, it's what the system has taught them. And so it didn't occur to them that someone else could look at the same video and and see a completely different story. Well, it's, it's because they're usually right. Yeah. History, history <laughs> is on their side, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, typically, I mean, again, I, I use Rodney King as the example. We all watched Rodney King get beaten. That wasn't enough. Our eyes wasn't enough. The beat, the, the battered, tortured black body wasn't enough. And this was far more uh, complicated in the minds of, of someone who doesn't see a black person as human, right? It, mm -hmm. Why was he in a building? What's he doing in there? Mm -hmm. if, if you believe that black people are always um, worthy of scrutiny and questioning, if you believe that we're not fully citizens, if you believe that we don't quite fit anywhere properly, it's the same thing that empowers George Zimmerman to question Trayvon Martin, what are you doing around here? As if you can't be in your own neighborhood, a kind of heightened sense of citizenship. All of these things um, create a dynamic where, yeah, if, if you view black bodies as criminal as such, then you might look at the Ahmaud Arbery video now, no one with with reasonable eyes and and, and, and a sense of humanity and and an understanding of the law uh, and would 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 say that McMichael's did anything but a brutal lynching. But we live in a country where whiteness is sometimes exculpatory, and 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 that becomes the problem. And so, it seems like a bad strategy on its face. It's one of those things where if it works, it's a bad. You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't seem as bad. Just like Rodney King's lawyer, you say, "What were they thinking? They should have pled until they until you know it works out for them." Or or the many 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 officers who don't get prosecuted or convicted or even uh, even even indicted for for killing black people, right? It's like why would they approach it this way? Well, because the state powers on their side, the media narratives are on their are on their side. Um, public sentiment is typically on their side. And so the reason why we delve into history so deeply is to give a sense of that backdrop, but also the fight that we've endured. And by we, I mean all of us who believe in freedom that we've endured to, to change that narrative. Ida B. Wells is changing public sentiment. She's trying to change the image of the lynching from a postcard where people are celebrating wh where they were mutilating and destroying and killing black bodies, hanging like strange fruit from poplar trees to saying, this is a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. King was saying, wait a minute, these bodies are getting beaten in the backwoods of Birmingham. No, we need to have them on the Pettus Bridge so people can do something about it. There's a way that at every turn, we're shifting that. Frederick Douglass, through his oratory, through his image, through his self-definition, through his multiple autobiographies, through him being the most photographed American of the century, more than the president himself, there's a way that he's trying to shift the narrative of what a Black man or Black human being is. So we're delving through history to show those possibilities, but also the work that we're up against. Uh, we're we're coming to the end of our discussion here, but I, I can't resist 
asking just this one more question. I hope I could get maybe a quick answer from either one of you, although it's a complicated uh, uh, topic. You know, the, your book discusses how technology or technology's role in this moment that we're in, um, a moment that was sparked by the death of George Floyd and how he died and how we all saw him died. What is your understanding of the momentum of the of the movement now? Is it still going? I'm, I'm going to say one thing and I'll give Todd the last word. I think as someone who's been on the ground as an activist for much of my life, most of my life now, the media picks up on these, these moments, these blips from Trayvon to Mike Brown to Breonna Taylor to, to now. And one could think that the only time something is happening is when the media picks it up. Like when the media became obsessed with police killing black people and then they became obsessed with Donald Trump, we were still fighting and organizing, right? So there's a movement that's going underneath, right? That, that, that transcends and supersedes the moment. And so these moments are part of the movement. And so when people ask where we are now, if we're talking about media narratives and media conversations, we're in a better place, but one could think that we're just waiting for the next killing to be outraged again. Hmm. What's interesting to me is that because of this work we've done with media and technology, we have shifted the way policing happens. We have shifted the way, uh, the way we talk about uh, organizing. We've shifted the way we talk about state violence and laws are being changed. For me, that's the exciting part. No knock warrants in, in, in Kentucky, you know, uh, you know, being able to uh, qualified immunity in, in, in cities and states, right? These are things that we can do and have done that have shifted the conversation. And so even though I am not uh, optimistic that things are going to be all right, I'm still deeply, deeply, deeply brimming with hope, like Du Bois in that, 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 uh, that painful chapter of Souls of Black Folk when he's talking about the passing of his son, Burghardt, and he talks about a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful, right? We're never without hope. There's too much energy. There's too much beauty. There's too power. Uh, but we got a long way to go. And the work that is happening on the ground by these courageous people, the Darnella Frasers of the world, the Janiqua Charles's of the world, you about to lose your job. <laughs> Those people are not just providing the soundtrack for free, our freedom struggle, they are the freedom fighters themselves. It's, a, it's all I brilliantly said by Mark, I would add only that the title of the book is Seen and Unseen. And um, that's a, derived from a James Baldwin quote and a James title of James Baldwin book. But what it, what it meant to us was that the, the seen part of it is that people who have not been seen for the longest time are being seen now through the, the nature of our technology. It is a positive story in that sense. It is a positive story that are that things that have been denied for so long are now being recognized. And the last chapter of our book is called Another Chance. And, and the reason it's called Another Chance is because we see these technologies as not, not um, just the uh, kind of chaos and burden that that technology and media in particular has become in, in our, our moment, we see them as extraordinarily powerful to change things, to show things that, are, to let us see things that have been unseen for so long. So let people who have been unseen unite together through social media and be seen in a different way to allow those who do not have the printing presses, do not have own television stations, do not own radio stations, all things that were required in order to be able to communicate in the past, to be able to communicate with a, with a, with a phone and, a, and, and a, a social media account, puts us in a very different place and new things are possible. And, and because they're possible, we do have the feeling that this book is ultimately about hope. Todd Brewster, Mark Lamont Hill, Thank you so much for your time, for your insights, and for this really fascinating book. Uh, thank you for this discussion with me and with our audience. Um, you can purchase this book from our indie bookseller partners at bookshop.org backslash shop backslash SDFOB. Please consider 
supporting our nonprofit partner, the San Diego Council on Literacy, by donating at literacysandiego.org. Continue joining us for more on-demand and live-streamed author panels. All videos will be available on sdfestivalofbooks.com. Again, I want to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, this was a lively and insightful discussion. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Dana Littlefield. I am public safety editor at the San Diego Union Tribune. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I'm Jose Cruz, CEO for the San Diego Council on Literacy, a proud partner with the San Diego Union Tribune in the 2022 presentation of the Festival of Books taking place this Saturday at USD. Today, we're at the festival site, and in just a few days, this campus will be buzzing with people who love books, love reading, and love writing. The Festival of Books is our community's largest single gathering place for writers, publishers, and book lovers of all ages. The San Diego Council on Literacy is the beneficiary of proceeds from this event. When you participate in the festival, you support greater literacy in our region. This means a lot of things, including more books for children who need them the most. And of course, by being here, you'll have a good time. So please join us Saturday, August 20th, as we converge with thousands of other festival attendees to celebrate the joy of reading here on the USD campus.